Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit Framework Community Development Demo Meeting. Uh, we made it past tax day, scooting on to May pretty soon. Uh, some good stuff to cover, so we'll dive in. Uh, we've got a bunch of new modules this time around. Um, again, similar to last time, a lot of them get you code execution. Uh, the module targeting the Zimbra collaboration suite that Jacob demoed at the last framework demo meeting, it's landed and it exploits an XML external entity vulnerability and a server-side request forgery to get you unauthenticated code execution on a target running vulnerable versions of the Zimbra software. Super cool. Uh, community contributor R. Rock Rue authored a module targeting a vulnerability in Atlassian's Confluence wiki software. This module exploits a velocity template injection and Confluence's widget connector macro to execute arbitrary code. No authentication required. Everybody likes those, right? And I believe we have a demo of that. Uh, we also have something from community contributor RatioSec, who created a module targeting a form file upload vulnerability in the Horde groupware uh, webmail, which allows an unauthentic sorry, it allows an authenticated user to execute PHP code via an unsanitized host parameter. Sanitize those parameters, people. Uh, community contributor Taius uh, has submitted a module targeting versions of WordPress that contain a local file inclusion and directory traversal vulnerability, allowing an attacker with creds to achieve remote code execution on the target via an image file which contains PHP code. Uh, community contributor QKaiser dropped off another module targeting Cisco RV130 and 130W routers running vulnerable firmware. This new module can get you unauthenticated remote code execution on the target via improper validation of user supplied data in the web-based management interface that triggers a stack-based buffer overflow. Community contributor Brenner Little authored a module which exploits a vulnerability with the Windows Contacts program, creating a zip file which can achieve code execution on the target so long as you can get the user to go through the steps of unzipping the file, opening the contact, and clicking the link presented to them, which seems like some users are pretty easy to get to do that still. Shelby, our own Shelby, provided a module targeting vulnerable versions of LibreOffice, which can achieve remote code execution via a specially crafted ODT file. When the user on the target opens this file, some sample macros that are included by LibreOffice's install itself are used to take advantage of a directory for traversal vulnerability and execute the payload within. And I believe we'll have a demo of this as well. Uh, last but not least, community contributor Synactive submitted an auxiliary module for grabbing user credential info from vulnerable versions of the WP Google Maps plugin for WordPress using an SQL injection via REST endpoint. So lots of good stuff there. Uh, let's see, let's talk about enhancements and features. Let's see, our own WVU improved the MSF console use command to apply intelligent search capabilities when the user does not specify an exact module name. If the argument specified to the use command still matches a single module, that module is automatically selected and the user is always given a, a full list of possible module matches and metadata as well in case there's multiple matches. It'll, it won't just pick one, it'll let the user decide which one they want. But if there's only one, that's what they get. And this was, a, I think, a piggybacker in conjunction with some work that Brent had done as well. And I think we'll have a demo of this. So stay tuned. Uh, Adam's reflective loader for Linux targets landed, which allows execution on targets without touching the file system or the usual exec VE syscalls, so super stealthy. That's very cool. Community contributor Core M added a new app API class of commands to Metal, allowing users to control or manage applications on an Android target. You can like install and uninstall and list and things like that. Very cool. Contributor Tim WR broadened Metal's clipboard support to now include both Mac OS and iOS. Uh, initially it was just Mac OS, now it's both you can, you know, hit up your phones and your iPads now and get that clipboard content. Tim WR also hooked us up with a signed with signed metal dynamic libraries for all supported iOS architectures. Very cool. And Brent offered a stability improvement aimed at certain embedded targets where LS command isn't requesting a wildcard match. We discovered that on some some embedded targets, <coughs> Cisco RV <coughs> routers, uh, they did not handle LS commands uh, super reliably. So this just makes them more stable. Bug fixes. So we had a security researcher, Luca Caratoni, reported a directory traversal vulnerability exploitable using the db import command to load a specially crafted zip file. Uh, this is a vulnerability in, in framework. So Sunny, our own Sunny, provided a fix to framework for this behavior. And as always, we appreciate responsible and coordinated, coordinated disclosure, helping make framework better for everyone. So thank you for that. 
Jeffrey fixed an issue with shellcode generation, which mostly seemed to affect Windows users that were on Ruby 2.5 or later. Uh, this helps ensure Metasm behaves the same across all OSs. The payload generation, shellcode generation. Community member Yavan XD provided a fix for the Apache range DOS aux module to ensure it does the run does run the check method against the intended target. Apparently, it was running the check method against localhost, not the intended target. Uh, Jacob fixed the HTTP client to not add two of the same host headers when creating an HTTP header. So, yay. Tim WR and Brent provided a fix so that the shell command in a interpreter session only uses a subshell when needed and not each time shell is called, which it had been doing each time shell was called. Awesome. Brent also offered a fix for PS exec exception handling, leading to more accurate failure information provided to the user when an exception does occur. I like that. Um, you can always read the details on the weekly Metis Point wrap-up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And as always, a huge thanks to all who helped make Metasploit better through their contributions. Thank you. And with that, time for demos. <laughs> the, the title of this one reminded me of the, the buffalo, 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 buffalo uh, <laughs> adage. So uh, I enjoyed that a lot. Use, use, use. All right, Brent, you want to take it away? I would love to. Awesome. So we're going to use use. Um, so within Metasploit, one of the mostly used commands is the use command. Uh, the use command is used to use modules, <laughs> to use payloads, to use whatever it is that happens inside of Metasploit. It's pretty much the fundamental thing, other than back. And if you've never used back before, back is the opposite of use. Like you can use something, and then you can go back and use. But mostly use is pretty simple. You use a module name and you interact with that module. But in the bad old days of Metasploit, let's say two weeks ago, if you type use <laughs> and you type something like psexec, um, you would get a long, long hang and no results. It would be really sad because you would think, well, surely Metasploit has psexec. Where is it at? Well, thanks to the magic of use, use now understands what you meant when you said use psexec. Instead of just failing, it actually tells you, well, did you actually mean one of these 20 different, 13 different things that PIGS exec um, is leveraged upon. So we can go over here and we can basically use now automatically guesses what you meant, does what you mean, and we'll give you all the options. Now, each of these options includes a long module path that you might want to type out to figure out what module you actually did want to use. Um, however, that's a lot of typing and Metasploit is all about not requiring the user to use extra words to say what they meant. So now you can actually type something like use decom exec, and it will actually automatically figure out what you meant, search for the module, and just use it. Um, you can also use it exploratorily. So I say I wanted to use TFTP, and I don't know what TFTP modules I want to use. It'll show me all the TFTP modules. Uh, if I go, oh yeah, I wanted the smart FTP one, uh, then it will just do the right thing and use the module. Um, effectively, all the complexity that we have behind the search command um, which most a lot of times people use for also searching for modules. Um, you can see it has a lot of options, but what we basically did was we we simplified, we simplified, we followed Henry David Thoreau's advice, and we made use follow the path, less travel. <laughs> so there we go. Um, oh that's God. use in a nutshell. Uh, Will, did I miss anything? Oops. No, um, it's actually almost a recursive implementation. So um, it. Uh, the, it's uh at first when i when i wrote it i ran into an infinite loop <laughs> um until i established my base case for it um but otherwise uh, your search dash u worked uh, beautifully for this and it was really only like a few lines of code to add this and i forgot the the impetus for this was we were going through the ticket queue of metasploit and we found that an issue from 2014 that i'd forgotten to actually ever address and someone was asking for, hey, could you put numbers next to the search output and make the dash u option select them? Mm -hmm. um, we iterated through that and added that to the search command. And then the natural conclusion was, well, why doesn't use just know how to search? And so that's how we ended up with this. Yeah. And this is one of those features where you always kind of knew you wanted it, but never knew how to vocalize it until you saw it. So uh, once we, once we you know, put all the pieces together and coded it out, it was exactly what we wanted. Yeah, it's one of those cases where you, you don't know what you want until you have it. Until you know. it's gone. Can you like reference that. something via the number? Can you do like use five? We thought about adding that. And um, thanks to our experience with um, documentation getting old in Metasploit, we, we opted not to allow the user to type mm -hmm. use 13 because um, because sorting and searching and Metasploit's always evolving with what modules it has. Um, 
use 13 may mean something else in a week. So because of that sort of instability of the output, we were worried that people would blog about use 13 and then someone would file a bug report. Use 13 didn't do what I expected. So rather than creating uh, a codified uh, thing that doesn't match anymore, instead we made it so that you have to be more explicit. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, and it's um, it's not always easy to disambiguate um, based on a number because um, we're, we're I mean we know search does more than just the module name. It'll it'll go through and search other things as well. Um, if it's a free form search without any uh, specific parameters, um, additionally uh, we'd have to be able to cache the number, the the numbered list in a way um, that makes sense between commands because you're not always going to run use or search that you right after running you know uh, a search I guess um, so coming back to it maybe minutes later um, you might forget it or it might mean something different yeah so it's purely sense. just for your own eyeballs to reference and okay else. all right that's it I'm gonna hand it to the next person thanks I think you're the next person Rick Actually, um, you're not. Uh, All right, cool. Oh, Shelby, Shelby was going to take this one over. We okay, awesome. about this morning. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and demo uh, the sleep rate on this uh, file format exploit. Uh, so basically, the software uh, it allow it, it gives the ability to create events and documents that, when triggered, you can execute a macro. And the way that it uh, executes this macro is it searches the file system for that specific file that the macro is in, and then it. Uh, executes the function with the function name and its arguments. So there's a directory traversal that's also in this uh, software that allows us to um, get another uh, file name and, and execute a function within that file name uh, that ends up executing a system or os.system. So you can get uh, code execution that way. So this is a file format exploit, like I said earlier. So we should just have our, uh, yeah, our uh, L host and port. And so you can just hit run. Here's the file. Uh, let's see, here it is. So open up this file. It might, might take a little bit. For some reason, it takes a little bit to open. Oh, okay. All right. And so I ended up just, um, so, so there is like a hyperlink here. But I ended up just blanking it out and making the font bigger, so it's more likely that somebody would hover over this. Let's say you hover over it, and then hopefully my listener actually has a session. Oh, cool! Yeah. So, yeah. Oops. So, the, so the on mouse over event is actually what triggers it, but it's it's you created it so the person yeah. would have to try really hard not to trigger it, <laughs> not, and then they won't be able to see it or anything. That's cool. Well, Yeah, so you should actually have one. Looks like the stager definitely triggered. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Awesome. Right. Right. Super cool. If you hover over it again, does it get another shell? Um, or is it only the first execute. time? Yeah, so it's, it's still going to execute that same command. That's awesome. Thank you, Shelby. Appreciate that. All right, Mr. Soto, take it on home for us. Yep. So uh, Pierce already mentioned the uh, Confluence widget connector uh, vulnerability and exploit that landed uh, in the last uh, cycle. So uh, this is a vulnerability in Atlassian Confluence that spans actually quite a few versions and operating systems. Um, and effectively, this is a, a default uh, kind of a plugin it's built into Confluence that allows you to embed objects. Uh, and so this vulnerability here is actually fortunately pretty straightforward. I've already got it, you know, kind of already set up here uh, and on Linux machines. So this is just a, a default install, just ran through uh, the wizard here. Uh, and so this 199.165 box is my Windows, or excuse me, my uh, uh, Ubuntu machine. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, this includes a, a URL. So this uses kind of this video player uh, you can change this URL into uh, whatever it is that you would like, as long as it's a valid uh, video. 
Uh, I wouldn't recommend that because this video will uh, never let you down. Uh, we'll never run around or hurt you. Um, but uh, you can change that to any YouTube video you want. Uh, and so anyway, we've got a, a Linux payload set up here, interpret payload. Uh, you notice when I run check, uh, it'll run a check on the target using, it actually executes Java uh, on the remote machine, uh, confirms it's vulnerable. And uh, of course, if we just do a run here, what it's gonna do is it's gonna upload a file to disk. It's gonna copy that file to a secondary location and then execute it. Um, now, there's a, there's a gotcha here, obviously we're going to interpret back. Uh, on a Linux machine, uh, fortunately the OS is kind to us and will let us actually delete the file that's running. That's just kind of the, one of the you know, nice things about Linux and Mac, um, is we can, we can clean up uh, the target afterwards. Um, so, okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo. There we go, there's our Linux box. Uh, if I pop out here, I also have a Windows machine. Uh, doo -doo -doo, and you notice he's uh, 199.152. Again, just a default install. Mm -hmm. And so when I run the check here, uh, sure enough, the target's vulnerable. Uh, if I go ahead and throw this at the target, uh, there's a check built into the exploit that is going to, well, that's not what I like to do, got me wrong, uh, that is going to confirm the operating system matches the payload. So in this case here, we've confirmed this is a Windows 10 machine uh, and reporting back that, hey, that payload is not probably the one you wanted. So let's go ahead and update our payload to be a uh, Windows, uh, let's see what we got here. Um, obviously all of our interpreters, I just can't remember if it's, hmm, how do I always fail at this? Tab complete, you <laughs> jerk. Oh, what am I doing wrong? Oh, I need to change my target, excuse me. Uh, change my target to Windows, there we go. And now I can change my payload. Set payload, Windows, now I'm getting some tab completion, yeah. So there's all of our interpreters and we'll do some reverse TCP. Uh, and obviously our check is unaffected by this, but when we go ahead and throw the exploit, uh, we progress past that window, the operating system check. Again, we write a file to disk, we copy it, we execute that file. You'll notice we do get an alert here that there are some files that were not able to be cleaned up and that's because Confluence actually has a file handle open to those two files. So unfortunately, with the nature of this exploit is that we can't do anything until the service restarts. So it does touch disk, it does leave some files on disk that we can't clean up, uh, but it is wonderfully reliable. Um, and yeah, there we go. Has that, has that been patched? Uh, yes, in, in later versions of Confluence, absolutely. Uh, and so in the, in the PR, uh, honestly, this took a while just to test all the different versions and figure out where the vulnerability lied, where it was exploitable and where it had been patched. Mm -hmm. And so we've got all the versions up there as to uh, what, what, it, what it will work on and what it uh, specifically will not. But you can absolutely throw it even against a, a patched version. It, it's it's a stable exploit, so we're not going to crash anything even if the machine's been patched. Yeah. Yeah. In the interest of full disclosure, this this landed a, a few minutes after we had cut the release last week, so it's it's in master. It just, but it'll it'll actually go out and start with the next the release we cut this week. I didn't realize that. Uh, okay. Yeah. It was yeah. literally a few minutes. I had to I, I had to I had to go look twice and dig deeper before I convinced myself. Oh. It was just barely. All right. Well, so, we're cheating and putting it in the demo anyway. So close. Well, yeah, we, it's flexible. <laughs> it's flexible. We're flexible, man. It's super cool. We wanted to show it. Awesome. So, great. Excellent.